Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our session on what can I do to establish a global career. Um, I'm Kelly Siegel Steckler. I'm a fifth year doctoral candidate at the School of Education. <clears throat> um, and I'm really excited about our panel today. Um, right now, I'm joined by Dr. Kristen Kozelski, um, who is the leader of the Neuroelectric Materials Group at the Institute for Functional Interfaces at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. And hopefully, um, if his technology starts to come together, we'll also be joined by Dr. Sumik Siddhanta, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. Um, and I'm really excited about this panel about international careers. Um, I myself studied uh, in England while I was in high school and I studied abroad in college and I'm really curious to hear about people who've taken that experience and made it a part of their professional lives in their postdoctoral careers. Um, so just to sort of start us off, Kristen, if you want to tell us a little bit about your background, um, your educational background, what you're doing now, and how you got interested in uh, working internationally in the first place. Sure. So um, I did actually both my bachelor's and my PhD at Hopkins. I was in the BME department. Um, and as an undergrad, I worked with Jennifer Alicia, who works in biomaterials and tissue engineering. And then for my PhD, um, my advisor was Jordan Green. So we worked in nanomaterials for drug delivery. And I was also co-supervised by Alfredo Quinones, who's in neuro-oncology. Um, and then I moved to Germany four years ago to do my postdoc. Um, and that was for three years at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, which is in Stuttgart, Germany, so in the south of Germany. Um, and while I was there, I was working on nanomaterials for wireless brain stimulation. And now I've been at my current position um, as a group leader at KIT in Karlsruhe for a little over a year. Um, I didn't really have a precise goal to move abroad when I did, but um, I think I was just in general looking for a place to do a postdoc as I was getting closer to graduating. And um, when the opportunity to move to Europe came up, it seemed like just sort of a fun bonus. So. Um, I had met my postdoc advisor at a conference about two years before I graduated. And at the time I sort of just sent my resume to say, hey, let's stay in touch, keep me in mind. Um, and which is, you know, universally a good idea to do for postdocs, both in the US and abroad. Um, and then when it got a little closer, I reached out again and I was able to go there and give a talk and see the lab. And uh, from there, then we started to do some like official things to get the position secured. Um, did you sort of have in mind while you were in graduate school that you might like to work internationally or um, were you sort of actively attending international conferences or things like that? No, not really. It was never really. I did a little bit. I didn't get to study abroad in college, but I did do a summer abroad in East Africa and then one uh, like a small project during grad school. But I never really considered it. It just sort of I was at this conference met my you know who would become my advisor later um and he was at the time he was still at Carnegie Mellon he was moving to Stuttgart that summer um and I remember I went back from the conference and I was talking to my husband about how cool this stuff was and he said yeah actually there's a lot of job opportunities for me in Stuttgart so let's keep it in mind and then a couple of years later it worked out um that's really great um so had you had an opportunity to sort of visit Germany or the place that you ended up um, starting your career before you went there? So I had never been to Germany like as a tourist or anything. Um, what I did was so the summer when I was about a year out from graduating, I had a conference in Turkey. Um, and then I emailed the advisor to say, hey, I'm sort of like in the neighborhood, not, you know, in the same continent, at least, could I maybe swing by on my way back and come and see the lab? And then they, uh, then they invited me. I gave a talk, got a lab tour, and got to meet you know other people in the lab um, before I moved. And I was also really lucky. I had a friend that was already living there, so um, I stayed with her for a little bit during the interview process, and then got to check out the area a little bit more beforehand. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, did you have any concerns about sort of adjusting to a new culture or um, 
what was the logistical process like of sort of making that happen? So um, especially for the first job, it was like any postdoc, right? Like I got a contract and then I moved there and um, set up shop. And I would also say when I was at the Max Planck, um, because my advisor had just moved from Carnegie Mellon, there were a lot of other people that were either American or um, not American, but recently coming from the US, um, that it was a pretty international environment and it wasn't so German. Maybe the, the institute sort of in the building next door was more and occasionally I'd go there for equipment and it, that was a little bit of a culture shock. Um, KIT, where I'm at now, is a lot more German. Um, so it was it was intimidating at first, I think, um, because at Max Planck, you know, you walk into a room and you speak English, even if you don't know anyone. And at KIT, that's not always true. So I'd had to be that awkward, but hey, yeah, my German's not so good. Can we switch? Sorry. <laughs> um, and um, it's also, I think it's tricky because I'm in an independent position now. So I didn't just like join a lab where I have a whole lot of colleagues that I can be like, yeah. oh, hey. <laughs> hey. Uh, but yeah, no, no worries. Do you want to do an introduction and then we can jump back in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Dr. Siddhanta, welcome. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry I'm... for the technical glitch because uh, <laughs> there was problem, LES problem in the email, it seems so. Yeah. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us now. <laughs> Um, if you are able, would you mind just sharing a little bit about your educational and professional background, um, sort of what you're doing now and uh, when you were abroad in the past and how you became interested in working internationally? Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, I was a postdoc, postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University uh, from 2015 to 2019 almost like uh, for a little more than four years. Okay, so uh, before that, uh, actually I come from India, uh, which is uh, an uh, eastern part of India, basically. Uh, it's a small town very near to Kolkata, if you have heard about it before. So, uh, uh, so I was really interested in uh, science and research from a young age, uh, coming from an academic family, uh, basically. I chose like I uh, bio and mathematics were my favorite subjects, so I chose to do chemistry so that I could actually branch out more <laughs> into other subjects. Uh, so that's why I did an undergrad in uh, chemistry uh, from Delhi University in India, and after that uh, I really got interested in uh, nanotechnology, uh, basically nano science and nanotechnology. So I enrolled for a master's and PhD in material science in one of the premier institutes in India for a uh, combined master's and PhD degree, uh, which, is, which is in southern part of India. Uh, it's an institute called JNCASR in Bangalore. And after completing, so I, uh, my PhD was on uh, spectroscopy, uh, vibrational spectroscopy, and also nanoscience together. So I used to study uh, something called surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Uh, which actually is a kind of spectroscopic techniques uh, uh, which gives a, a, a lot of information. Uh, and I used to actually study biological systems, basically. So it used to give a lot of information about like how uh, different biophysical events, like how molecules interact with proteins and so on. So then I got a chance to uh, go to Hopkins uh, and uh, was fortunate enough to uh, get a position uh, uh, also an opportunity to work under Professor Ishan Berman uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So there uh, I explored this technique in uh, biomedical uh, imaging, basically. So uh, or biomedical or molecular imaging. So that's how uh, I got into Hopkins. And then uh, after, after around four years, uh, I was applying for jobs uh, in various places and then uh, I got offers from UK and in India, and also there was something going on in US also, but uh, considering many other factors, I decided to come back and uh, start a lab at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi, uh, which is one of the premier institutes in India. And currently uh, my lab is, uh, I mean, because of the COVID situation, it got a little delayed, but now I got my lab and first batch of students uh, quite excited to 
uh, you know, <laughs> to get productive very soon and start, you know, start uh, my research uh, in uh, full, full fashion, basically. You know, still there are some restrictions because <laughs> of the COVID, but I think the students will be back uh, soon to the labs. Um, so after finishing your PhD um, and coming to Hopkins, were you specifically looking to find a postdoc in the United States or were you looking for um, just the right lab and uh, the U.S. happened to be the place where you ended up? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I was quite clear that uh, either I will go to the U.S. or uh, to one of the countries uh, in Europe uh, you know, for example, like U UK and Germany, where uh, language is not a problem. So that was one of the criteria. Uh, and the second criteria was, of course, uh, the lab, because you have to match your interests. OK, so everything fell into place and I landed up here. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you sort of actively trying to network internationally during your PhD? Did you attend international conferences or reach out to PIs in other countries that you were interested in? Yes, pretty much uh, throughout my PhD. So uh, just after, just before I got my master's degree, like in, in the MS PhD phase, mm -hmm. uh, I had a chance to spend a month in Grenoble in France, uh, uh, attended one of the summer schools there. It's called ESON, European mm -hmm. School of Nanosciences and Nanotechnology. It's a very famous school now. And uh, I met uh, attendees from all around the world, even professors from different parts of Europe. Uh, so that was my first brush uh, uh, with an international uh, in a group of people. And of course, like uh, during uh, in India also, there were a lot of international conferences which I got to attend, uh, fortunately, in, in my institute and in, my, in the city. Uh, but uh, going to France was uh, kind of an eye-opener about all these things. So I was pretty uh, certain that I wanted to uh, go abroad for PhD or for jobs. So that, that's happened. Then in the next year, uh, in the first year of my PhD, I got a chance to uh, join the international summer school uh, hosted by BASF in, in Germany. OK, that's also one of the uh, well-known summer schools in chemistry, if you, if you know, like chemistry and chemical engineering in that area. So there I had an exposure to uh, industry, okay, and how R&D is done in industry and you know, how industry works and how research in industry happens. Okay, so that was a very nice experience. Then uh, after that, I, uh, I had been to big uh, international conferences. For example, I went to the ICMAT conferences in Singapore. So that actually allowed me to network a lot. Uh, with prospective, uh, because at that time I was uh, nearing the end of my PhD. So I could actually uh, network a lot uh, with a lot of senior professors. Uh, but uh, uh, but what happened was like, uh, but during the postdoc search, um, the my postdoc PI, I had uh, in fact never met him before. <laughs> okay, so that happened by just normal applications, through normal applications. <clears throat> Um, so one thing I wanted to ask about, um, and it sounds like, Sumik, you've um, been to quite a few different places. Um, mm -hmm. Have you found um, that academic culture is really different from country to country and place to place? And has that sort of changed how you're doing research and what your lab experience has been like? I guess, Kristen, we'll start with you. Um, if you yeah, wanna... sure. So one of the biggest difference, I would say, is that academic research environments in Germany um, are a lot more structured than um, in the US. And like a great example is, for example, like let's say I needed to use a large piece of equipment. Um, when I was at Hopkins, often I would get trained how to use it by maybe a postdoc that's like spends part of their time in charge of maintaining that equipment. And then I would collect the data on my own. Here, um, any larger facility or equipment is run by senior scientists. So um, this is true in Germany, but I think a lot of other uh, sort of similar countries like Switzerland, for example, that they have a whole lot of permanent senior scientists. So if you were gonna use an electron microscope or something, that would be run by someone whose full-time job is to maintain that equipment and to run experiments on that equipment. 
Um, so because of that, there are pros and cons. The con is things can be a little slower, right? If I am in a time crunch and I just need a picture to put in a publication, I can go do it whenever I want in the States. Um, and that's not true in Germany. The pro though is, um, you know, instead of me just kind of like driving the little controllers around, uh, like blindly just hoping to find something instead, because there's an expert on this, I not only get better pictures, but also they'll say, oh, by the way, did you know this EM can do this other thing that will show you elemental analysis? And I'll say, no, I did not know that. Thank you for devoting your life to EM. <laughs> um, so, and that's true for a lot of the ways that I think the university is run. Um, so things are a lot more official, which can make them sometimes more bureaucratic and slower. Um, but I think often what you get out of it is really good. And also in the short, you know, in the long run, you do save time because you're not the one always collecting that data. Um, Sumik, do you have any insights? Yeah, I also uh, feel uh, uh, the same. But the thing is, like uh, here in India, uh, they follow a model quite similar to the US. Okay. So things are not very different here. It's uh, not as structured as uh, which I saw in Europe, uh, as rightly pointed out by Kristen. So just like the US, uh, you have to do a lot of things yourself. OK, like, uh, for example, you have to learn how to use an instrument and also manage different parts of the project. OK, unlike uh, places where you have specific people for specific things allotted right so they work as a group and then you get a overall work done uh, but uh, in india and also in the us i think uh, uh, as a postdoc or as a pi probably uh, leadership is very important so you have to get a lot of things done from various places so uh, of course there are pros and cons uh, of that kind of setup uh, the Pros is that you can get a lot of things done, as Christine just said, uh, more, much more faster. OK, you don't have to go through a lot of bureaucratic channels. OK, so that is uh, some of the pros. But uh, cons are that uh, the initial training process might be a little painful, OK, <laughs> learning so many things. Uh, but once you overcome that barrier, I think uh, things become easier in that case. And But in India, like, uh, so people who are coming back here, uh, they won't find the system to be very different from the US at least. But yeah, if you're coming, uh, if you have prior experience in Europe coming to India, then uh, it's going to be a little bit, uh, you have to adjust a little bit in the new environment. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I think people worry about <laughs> Um, also with research culture abroad, um, and both of you are lucky to work in environments that are pretty um, English focused, is that when you're working at a high level in a really technical environment, um, it can be especially challenging to overcome those language barriers. Um, talking about really complex ideas um, and using language that has a lot of nuance or specificity. Um, sort of working in an international setting, how do you manage having people with different levels or um, backgrounds in language and overcoming those kinds of challenges? Um, um, I guess I can go first. Um, so yeah, it's really, in terms of scientific stuff, it's really not that bad. Usually scientists are pretty good at English. I would say at KIT, the the Worst case is that, like for a scientist, that maybe that person hasn't used English in a little bit, but they are effectively fluent. Um, so that doesn't get in the way. More often than not, uh, maybe with like um, administrative people, sometimes uh, it's better. They would prefer to speak German and often with admin people, you need something from them, right? So you want to keep them happy. Um, uh, similarly, like my department's lab manager is, um, it, it's often better if we speak German or at least she speaks German, I speak back to her in English. That just makes things easier. But I think if somebody completely didn't know German, it, it would also be fine. Um, and it definitely depends on the school. So KIT, um, 
probably isn't quite as international as like a Max Planck Institute, um, but it's certainly more international than a really small school in a smaller town. Um, so it's, it's really not so bad. I think, you know, nowadays everybody publishes their work in English. So there's nobody at a higher scientific level that can't speak English. So it's really, you know, it's unfortunate for the rest of the world, but for Americans, it's, um, it's a privilege, I guess, to be able to move around and know that people will speak English, at least in a scientific environment. Okay, so yeah, so uh, in my case, it's a little bit interesting that, uh, so in my country, there are 18 major languages, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, having said so, I think English uh, people normally speak uh, in English. But the only uh, difference, like, for example, if you come to India or uh, any Asian countries, I will say, uh, that the pronunciation uh, and the other things might be a little different. Uh, otherwise, the basic structure of the English will be same, will be similar, although there's a subtle difference between British and American English, because uh, in India, we follow a really British kind of English because we were, they, they were the colonizers, right? So, uh, so you'll find a little bit of difference, uh, but I think uh, during uh, you know, publication wise or something, uh, it's normally taken care of by various software nowadays. So if you like write something in British English, so there are some changes, you know, in uh, in spellings also. For example, you might be knowing in America we write C O L O R for color, and in British English we write like C O L O U R. Okay, so that's really funny, like how these small differences crop up. But otherwise, uh, working, so for me as an Indian, uh, after going to Hopkins in the US, I had absolutely no problem in communicating uh, and also my ideas and other things. And likewise, I also don't think like if anybody comes here, uh, they will face uh, any problem in communicating their science ideas. Although, like, if you go around in the city, it might be a little difficult uh, with some people. But I think in the university setting, uh, it will be absolutely uh, no problem. So it will be quite comfortable. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, a little bit, of, uh, like, for example, after going to uh, US, so mostly what happens is uh, we are not native English speakers, right? So what we tend to do sometimes is uh, we just translate uh from directly from our language word by word sometimes you know we have a tendency to do that as in non native speakers so that that's why sometimes you might find some of the sentences really funny <laughs> sometimes or not you know not uh, with a proper flow or something but otherwise uh, it will be uh, quite understandable overall yeah um do you think that there are skills or experiences that were part of your um, American training in a PhD that have actually been especially valuable to you outside of a U.S. setting or a postdoc um, training in the U.S.? Do you think that, um, I know Kristen and mentioned that uh, structures and academic culture is different um, in Europe, how do you think the sort of skills you developed um, in your PhD and postdoc training have translated in different ways abroad than they might have uh, had you stayed in the US? Hmm. So I would say in Germany, at least, um, I think American scientists tend to be really good at like salesmanship um, and kind of advertising, um, or at least like the more advertising aspects of having a research career um, and that's growing in Germany, but I don't think it's sort of, it, especially to like sort of the older professors that are maybe 10 to 15 years from retiring, it's not something that they think about too much. So I will say it's been beneficial to me um, as an American in Germany to have had that training during my PhD because I think I wouldn't get quite as much guidance in it um, in Germany. So it's helpful. And then conversely, I would say, you know, the things that that are nicer about 
like the German system, like I was discussing with having these senior scientists, you know, I really hope, and I think some schools in, in the US are going to this way, going this route, um, because they're realizing the value of having continuity, you know, for decades running certain facilities or equipment. Um, and the other thing too, is I had a lot of friends that were doing a PhD and they wanted to stay in academic science, but the faculty route wasn't really for them. Um, and those kinds of jobs are exactly perfect for someone that's a great PhD student, but doesn't really like the um, sort of grant writing side of, uh, and the more public side of um, being a faculty member. Um, Sumik, do you wanna weigh in? Yeah, yeah, so, uh... Yeah, of course, like for me, uh, the postdoctoral training uh, has been quite uh, helpful, of course, like uh, uh, so in every aspect, I'll say, OK, from the science aspect to, uh, you know, because uh, uh, I mean, being at Hopkins personally, for example, uh, it's very uh, bio oriented and there is a very strong collaboration between the engineering and the you know, uh, medical school, for example. So uh, being exposed to that kind of collaborative atmosphere, I have not seen that before, for example. Okay. So how uh, these two very strong departments work together and how they build collaborations, very successful collaborations. So that's one of the things which I took back home, you know, <laughs> for future. And uh, there are many aspects like you you see a lot of multicultural work environment in the US, for example, okay? You see people from China, people from Europe, and you learn their way of work, okay? You see how they work, okay? Like Europeans, for example, Germans, uh, they have a different style of working, for example, and uh, people from China. So you tend to, uh, you have an opportunity to learn uh, the best from them. <laughs> the good traits from them and develop your own. So that's one of the uh, good things uh, I learned. I think and that's a, I actually want to ask, I think that's a great sort of segue. <clears throat> Do you think there are stereotypes or particular ways that people perceive American trained uh, <laughs> PhDs abroad? Uh, no, I think uh, not really in India. Uh, there are no stereotypes. Actually, uh, there's a huge respect uh, for people who are trained in U in the U.S. Uh, partly because the system here, the education system here is uh, very much similar. And also, uh, they know that uh, the training is quite rigorous. So the perception is that training in U.S. is quite rigorous. Uh, like it, it is as it's probably one of the most rigorous training that you receive anywhere in the world. So that's the perception. But other than that, there is no real uh, stereotypes, I guess. Yeah. But I think Tristan might have some other views. No, I, I would agree that the for sure people presume that if you're coming from the U.S., then you're probably great. Mm -hmm. Um which I'm sure sometimes is really wrong, right? <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. um, it's nice to have that benefit of the doubt. I think as an American, both at work and in life, I am conscious of you know not being too loud or too pushy or things like that. Um, but it's possible that a lot of that, especially at work, is just in my head. You know, if, mm -hmm. if I've ordered something and it's not coming, I try not to be that person all the time that's like, hey, where is this? Um, and, and honestly, in agreement with what Sumek said, I think that people are often pleasantly surprised to have someone from the U.S. in their institute. Or like I've gotten a lot of, oh, and she's from the U.S. And it, okay. so it's, um, if anything, it's a like a positive stereotype. Um, thank you guys both so much. Um, mm -hmm. I want to pivot a little bit to talk about your more personal experiences moving mm -hmm. abroad. Um, especially, I know Sumik, you mentioned the challenges related to COVID lately, um, but I think even in normal times, right, being across the globe from your friends and family, um, even your academic support networks can be a real challenge. Um, how has it been navigating that at the same time as trying to advance your scientific careers? 
Um, I guess yeah. I can go first again. So um, in terms of personal life stuff, like I'm really lucky that when I moved here, my husband was able to move with me. So um, that's not a problem. And communicating with family members, honestly, it's been a little bit easier because most people are working from home and everybody's schedules are more flexible. So being able to have a Skype call is, is significantly easier. Um, yeah, in terms of work stuff, um, it's obviously been a little tricky because this was my first year in an independent position. I was supposed to be going to a lot of conferences, both in the US and in Europe. Um, and most of those were canceled. Uh, a couple were moved online. Um, so, you know, it is a really key time. I think once you become independent, the type of networking you do is a little bit different because people stop seeing you as so-and-so's postdoc or so-and-so's PhD student and start seeing you as, you know, the head of your group. So trying to build your group's brand, um, it, it's definitely been harder with, with COVID, but it's also been possible. You know, I think just the threshold with these online conferences, the threshold to talk to somebody is a little bit scarier, right? Because normally you could walk up after the talk and say, hey, I really liked your talk and blah, 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 right? But in order to send an email, you probably feel like you have to have a really specific question. You can't just say, hey, great talk. Thanks, stay in touch. Um, so uh, that part of it has been tricky, but it's also, I guess, forced me to, um, there's times that I've thought, well, I could just not say anything and I could stay in my pajamas and no one will know that I was ever even at this conference, right? But then I thought, well, I really do need to reach out to this person because I think we could collaborate. And Corona's kind of given me that like kick to do that a little more often than I think I normally would. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, so i think uh, uh my <laughs> so uh, i would have said uh, some of the same things that uh, christian just said uh but just to add to it yeah of course it becomes a little difficult to uh communicate like we are very used to communicate face to face right uh in conferences and uh I think people are more confident or uh, they get a better idea if you if they see you face to face probably uh, to it's I think it is easier to make a uh, proper perception or you know about a person face to face rather than on a video video call with some fake background sometimes okay <laughs> so I mean it's a little different setting that we are still getting used to it and of course, like the COVID, uh, we are not having proper, I mean, everything is very restricted in terms of usage of facilities and starting uh, some experiments and keeping some experiments going on. And uh, also supplies and everything has, uh, uh, is everything affected uh, definitely. So basically you have lost few months uh, of very crucial period uh, in your career, I'll say. Uh, but, uh, at the same time, like, uh, I mean, of course, like uh, through video conferencing, it has been uh, possible to stay in touch with everyone, with your group and have group discussions and also attend a lot of conferences online. Uh, but I do miss travel a little bit, uh, probably because I have a different take on that. So I used to like uh, in a few months before the lockdown started, uh, I attended a few conferences in person. I realized that uh, nowadays, uh, uh, I was like uh, really busy in a lot of things, setting up the things. So it was kind of extra load. But traveling gave you some time to get away from the madness. Okay. Have time uh, of your own and then uh, finish your pending work without any interference. Okay. <laughs> so uh, for me, yeah. So that was a little bit of loss. Uh, <laughs> loss Because now you're always in, the, in this zone. <laughs> okay. You cannot get out of it uh, <laughs> somewhere else so yeah um have you noticed any difference in hiring practices or willingness to um have americans come on as collaborators or potential hirees where you are as a result of the covid virus um so for us so i did actually i had two students that were going to come and do an undergrad summer internship 
um, this summer coming from the US, one actually from Hopkins. Um, and unfortunately the timing of that, cause it would have been like end of May um, and into August, those got canceled, not just from the German side, but also those students had fellowships from their schools and um, though those fellowships were postponed. Um, but that was kind of all during, and, and at the time all hiring at my institute was, was frozen temporarily. Um, now, even though Germany's also hit a second wave and we've gone into a lockdown, they haven't closed borders in any way. So if you have a contract to come and do a job. Um, it doesn't really matter where you're coming from because if it's a risk area, you just quarantine when you first arrive before you start working. Um, and one thing that's, that's a big difference, I would say, is so universities in Germany and in most of Europe, um, their budget is pretty independent of student tuition. So um, if there's an academic downturn, like most places are experiencing now, um, KIT isn't worried about enrollment changing what their budget is going to be. So there was a, a halt, I think, for a few months in posting new jobs, hiring new people, while everyone was just figuring out what was going on. Um, but now everything is effectively um, back to normal. Okay. Sumik, have so, you noticed anything in India? Yeah, like, of course, uh, because of the travel restriction, I think uh, US nationals are still, uh, I mean, they cannot come uh, inside our country normally, unless it is very much required, probably. So we had a few conferences uh, canceled where we were expecting a lot of, uh, like, people, even Nobel laureates from US coming here. So those kind of conferences really, uh, give rise to very good collaboration sometimes, uh, student exchanges and, you know, uh, people going there. So there are many fellowships like Fulbright uh, fellowships and all. So uh, students get an opportunity to, to really interact with their prospective uh, PIs and then apply for this fellowship. So those things were put on hold uh, because of this. Uh, but otherwise, uh, 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 and in terms of hiring, of course, like, uh, in India, since uh, travel is restricted, but the hiring has not stopped, I'll say. There was a freeze uh, for a couple of months during the peak lockdown period, but uh, everything is back to normal. And uh, instead of physical interviews, they're having all these video conferencing interviews. So <laughs> it's a little funny, but uh, it's happening, yeah. Um, so one thing I want to touch on, we have a few people asking in the chat, um, Vivian and Tara have both asked about um, sort of the challenges of managing your personal life when you have an international career. I know, Kristen, um, you mentioned that your husband was able to move um, with you to Germany and Sumik, I'm not sure if you have a family or a partner, um, but can you talk a little bit, I guess, Kristen, we'll start with you about the logistics of sort of making that possible in this uh, sort of process of being abroad and establishing a global presence? Yeah, I think it just required a lot of planning. So like I said, I had already reached out to the guy I ended up working for about two years before, which is that no one needs to do it that early, but early is good. Um, and then when I went for the interview, it was a year out. And some of that is honestly my own um, you know, I, I don't like surprises, so uh, I didn't want to sign up to a place and not be able to check it out first and have some time to consider if I wanted to be there. Um, but what that gave us was a good window of time for my husband to start looking at jobs um, where we were going to be. Um, so it is tricky because I think I... Um, even when I looked to move to KIT, which isn't really far away from, from Stuttgart, I didn't even uh, move apartments. Um, you know, f for having a partner that also has a career, we just kind of always have to keep in mind, like, well, if I apply for a position somewhere, is there potential for him to find work um, and vice versa? So it's definitely tricky. Um, I think uh, it can be difficult in Europe, like, so for science, again, people often speak English, but for the type of work that he, he does, um, it's more often that they would still want you to speak German. So that can be a barrier. Um, 
so you just have to really decide what um, your priorities are. For us, we had done long distance a little bit when we were younger and we decided that we didn't really want to do it for any um, measure of time again, maybe like for a few months while somebody moves and somebody else finishes up a job. But um, outside of that, we prioritize staying together. So you just have to be really clear about what both of your goals are um, and what you want to do and what you want to, where you want to end. Because I think for us, when we first moved, we both thought like, oh, we'll live in Europe for a few years and then we'll move back to the US. And after about a year, we both really liked Germany. Um, so then I started looking for independent positions here. But it just takes a lot of communication, I guess, and clarity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Mike, do you have anything uh, for, to add? Yeah, so uh, it's probably the same condition <laughs> for everyone. So uh, my wife had to uh, leave her job in country in, in India uh, when, and then she had to move in with me in the U.S. Uh, during my postdoc period, and then uh, so it influences the way you apply for a job uh, because if you have to make sure that your partner also. Uh, gets the job right in that setting. So, uh, my luckily my wife was uh, international school teacher. So we had uh, she had quite uh, good opportunities uh, pretty anywhere we went uh, pretty much. But uh, also at the same time uh, we had to make sure that we, uh, for example, in India I couldn't apply uh, to jobs more than a couple of places because we had to be in cities. So that was one of the things where they have international schools. So this kind of uh, things take place, like you have to consider. And also like in the US, uh, we were a little concerned, like if, uh, or in the UK, that if we get a job, probably in the interiors or not near the cities, then also it's going to be a problem probably. So yeah, we have to uh, balance all those things. And moving is never easy, <laughs> so you have to always, adjust to the new life and uh, it has its own challenges like uh, for example uh, from india if you go to us it really you need to learn how to drive <laughs> okay <laughs> otherwise you don't go anywhere uh, that's one of the issues so there are a lot of issues like that you have to navigate your visa issues and uh, you know ins health insurance you when you land up there you don't have any idea Okay, then when your wife also goes there, you don't have much idea what to do. <laughs> like, of course, like uh, gradually you learn, come to know everything from uh, very supportive, uh, you know, postdoc and grad students uh, group, and also the international uh, office, you know, OIS and JHU. They actually help a lot in these things. So ultimately, uh, we tied over all these situations, but it's always uh, tricky to move around. I'll say. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the different country is very challenging, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, even if you're moving within the US, I think sometimes we underestimate the the difficulty involved in going to a new place, not just making new friends and adjusting to a new mm -hmm. job, but like finding a new place to get your hair cut, figuring out a new dentist, right? Mm -hmm. And that's triply complicated when you're moving to another country and even the systems um, mm -hmm. right. You go to the grocery store and you don't even know what is in the bottles you're looking at. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's a real, a real point. Um, mm -hmm. and I think it also feeds into another one of our questions from the audience, which was, um, did you feel like once you committed to researching or teaching abroad and to going to a specific place that you really had to stick with it? Or was it easy to feel like you had the opportunity to move to different places and con continue to look at, uh, career opportunities in other countries? Um, so for me, I think with a postdoc, that's kind of the ideal time to hop around a little bit, right? Because if it's if you're somewhere for only a year, no one's going to be really concerned by that. And if you're somewhere for four or five years, no one's really going to be concerned that, by that. It's not structured like a PhD program. Um, and it's totally fine if you, let's say you get to a lab, decide you don't like it, and move back to the US or move to another lab within another country, people will say, oh, you just had a like a brief, you know, a brief research experience there, right? Like that's, so it's very easy to 
sort of cover stuff up like that. Um, once you once you go independent, it can become a little trickier, um, especially for countries that have the U.S. system. So U.S., U.K., um, I, th I think India um, and a lot of the like the Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg, those countries tend to have a similar system where it's an assistant professorship with tenure track. Um, Germany, it's a little trickier. It's they don't have really traditional tenure tracks. So, um, you know, I am in a role that the goal of my position is to stay there forever, but it wouldn't be if I decided I didn't like it, which I do so far, um, it wouldn't be abnormal at all for someone at my career stage in Germany to move, um, move places. So, but yeah, in short, for most of the people, I think in this audience that are PhD students or postdocs, um, it's really easy. The postdoc is a great time to try a new thing out, both in terms of your life and the country you live in, as well as, um, as well as the lab that you're going to be in. Yeah, so uh, I completely agree uh, with Kristen. Uh, so the only difference is uh, that uh, in India, like, I mean, you don't have so, so many options as in, in the US, I'll say. Like in the US, you have many great places to work, work in. You can choose to move to East Coast or West Coast, or if you don't like the snow, you can go to California and other things like that. You get equally good places to work in. Uh, not that you don't get that many good institutes here uh, in India still now. It's uh, things are getting better. New institutes are coming, so that was not an option basically for me because. I already got into uh, a premier institute kind of so and also like moving places here is difficult i say once you if you're an experimentalist like me uh, it is uh, very tricky okay and uh, uh, yeah so and also i didn't apply to many places in india as such because of the constraint which i said like family constraint and all so in that case i was pretty sure like if i get this job i'll, I'll go here kind of thing Okay, and as Christian said that uh, I think postdoc is a good period to uh, explore uh, because that actually uh, adds to your advantage. <laughs> okay, like uh, the more you get exposure in different working conditions and if you are successful in, uh, in being pro productive in different labs. So I think that's a great testament to your uh, adaptability and leadership so so i think that's very important uh, in postdocs uh, postdoc period but not very sure whether the same applies uh, in terms of faculty uh, unless you make a very big jump <laughs> from a tire two or tire one or something like that <laughs> yeah i will say to add on to that again this is a difference between like the us uk system and um mm -hmm and here so because again there's no like i was explaining so because things are um a little more structured and because there's no tenure track that's in the same way the big difference is so in the u.s when you become independent more often than not you're an assistant professor and you're given a startup budget to build your own lab um the difference is here uh someone at the same career stage in germany they don't want you to build your own lab. They want you to join an institute that for the most part already has the facilities and equipment that you would need. Maybe a few, some small things and you buy chemicals that are specific to what you do. But um, actually like when I apply to grants, it's really frowned upon if I request equipment that's over 10,000 euros because their, their thought is, well, if you're telling me in this grant application, you're in the right place. If you're in the right place, they should, for the most part, have this big stuff that you need. Um, so that does kind of make it a little bit, sorry, my dog came in. That does make it a little bit more flexible um, to, uh, to move around, even when you are an experimental scientist. Um, but uh, that's, that's one difference, I would say. <laughs> um, that's that's one difference. So it, it is more common for people at my stage to still be possibly moving around. Um, I don't. I think I didn't really like that idea when I first started doing it, but I've gotten adjusted to it. 
Um, did you find either of you that there's a real difference in your ability to find funding based on where you are geographically? I know in the US, we're very used to the idea that, um, at least I'm in the social sciences, so this is very real for us, but um, what sort of funding opportunities are available tends to be sort of um, based on trends of what's popular or current, um, and also sometimes political, right? What people are invested in at the time. Um, and did you see major changes in your ability to sort of solicit funds as you moved to a new place? Um, so I will say like, I it's because I came from the medical side of Hopkins, my comfort zone was NIH funding. I had, I had um, applied for some when I was a grad student and then I um, helped in the writing of some grants with my PhD advisor. So it was a little scary when I moved to Germany that all of a sudden, for the most part, the NIH won't fund research outside of the US. Um, the, officially they say they will, but it's like, it, the funding rates are already pretty low sometimes. So if you throw in uh, an additional sort of asterisk to your application, that can make it worse. Um, but it, and it took a while to find um, the sort of comparable like R21 and like young investigator awards that you would see from the NSF and the NIH. But um, eventually, especially once I moved to KIT, because I was working with people that were all German and had been in the system forever, um, then they they told me about a whole lot of different things um, to apply for. Um, so it wasn't too bad, I would say. Yeah, in uh, India, I think the funding uh, system is a little bit different because uh, unlike in US, uh, here you don't have to pay your students or postdocs or for your lab. So everything is, and you get a fixed research grant per year uh, from the government, uh, if you're in a government institute. So uh, we don't have to take care of all those funding things, okay? Like uh, we we don't have to worry that our labs will get shut if, if we don't get funding uh, in this time. And it's always a little bit scary. Like you write, if you submit a fund, and for the next six months, you won't know uh, the result, right? So that's, there's always an element of uncertainty in that case. Uh, here it is not that, uh, but, uh, uh, but the thing is that uh, there are not many big uh, funding uh, which happen here, like the million dollars kind of thing. So. Uh, here the money comes, uh, there are a lot of agencies, but money comes in batches. So you have to be very patient and uh, gradually build up your capabilities rather than you know hitting it big uh, initially. Like you have this uh, early career kind of NIH kind of grants where you can pretty much buy anything you want. <laughs> so uh, it's not like that here. Uh, yeah, so otherwise it's, it's the same. Um, so actually something Kristen said about working with all of these people who had been in the German system for a long time, um, I want to, before we sort of wrap up, um, get to one more audience question that was about sort of establishing relationships in a new place that can help you navigate, um, you know, thriving in science and in your life as you're um, adjusting to a new environment. So how did you uh, work on finding mentors and building relationships in a new country? Um, so it was definitely hard. And I, again, I think it was easier now that I have an independent position because, I again, people see you more as you, not as someone else's student or postdoc. Um, in the past year, I've made a lot of connections through online conferences. Um, so either I give a talk and someone reaches out to me or I've watched a talk and reached out to whoever was speaking. Um, I've honestly also made a lot of connections on Twitter. Um, so I highly recommend if you want an academic career to create a Twitter account and keep it separate from, if you want to have a private one, um, just make sure to keep it separate. Um, and the other thing too is especially because uh, before I moved here, I was in the market for independent positions. Um, those kinds of job interviews, you usually give a talk and you have several one-on-one -on -one interviews with people that are in the department you're applying to. So I've made a lot of connections there, even from places that I didn't end up going to. 
in the end. Um, and in terms of making personal connections, it was definitely hard at first. I think it's a combination of, uh, I think Germans and maybe all Europeans are less inclined to just talk to a stranger at like a local bar or something like that um, than we are in the States. Um, so it was, it was kind of hard. And I think a lot of the friends I ended up making were through activity. So I joined like a beach volleyball group and I met some people there. And then a couple of them lived kind of in the same area as me. So I sort of glommed onto their friend group once I had met them through, through volleyball. So I highly recommend uh, any kind of activity. So either sports or if you play an instrument, there's usually a lot to find. And that's um, especially an easy way. Like it gets harder to be, to make friends as you get older. Um, and that's a good way to do it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so, so I think uh, in uh, India and also like as Indians, if you uh, go to the US, you get a lot of information nowadays from the social media sites. For example, Facebook, you know, even before uh, you reach that place. Uh, so even before I went to Baltimore from here, I could, I had a lot of information and uh, had a pretty fair idea how, uh, how is the environment where I'm going to stay. And I could connect people, uh, you know, beforehand, uh, before. And also like the same way happened when I came back. Okay, so you, you get a lot of information from even from LinkedIn uh, and Facebook and Twitter if if you want. So that actually makes uh, your life pretty easier. And also, I think uh, you have to also understand the culture a little bit. Uh, for example, uh, it's pretty like as Christian just said, like uh, you have to involve in some activities that actually breaks some ice and makes you can make good friends. But you have to also probably learn a little bit about the culture because uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, you can approach someone, a uh, prospective collaborator, or, you know, you can take them to a pub, for example, for a drink. So that is very uh, uh, typical uh, cultural stuff, I will say. Then you can have some, uh, you know, conversation over, over beer or something. But the other way is always not true because here uh, it is uh, becoming more and more uh, natural uh, to have a drink and conversation, but it's not that prevalent as in uh, US or Europe. So you need to understand the culture a little bit, not to offend people. Okay. <laughs> and also probably uh, the kind of food and also you need to have some idea about the place, I'd say. Otherwise, uh, right now, I think everywhere in the world, if you're going to any cities, so there is a lot of exposure uh, through the media and also people know, okay, people know the culture. Even we watch a lot of uh, American Netflix serials and other things, so where you get a good exposure about uh, the culture. So that also helps. And in terms of personal contacts, yeah, there are a lot of groups nowadays. Okay, for example, if you go to the US or if you come to India, so if you are introduced to those groups, they will take care of your basic, you know, uh, necessities once you go to a new place. Even they can come and pick you up from the airport initially, so that's not a problem. All right. Well, I just want to. Um, we've hit one forty-five, um, and I want to thank you both so much. Um, for joining us today, um, even despite our slightly rocky start. Um, it was yeah. really wonderful to hear about both of your experiences um, from both the perspective of somebody who's American and moved abroad and somebody who's not American and came here. Um, so I thought it was really wonderful to hear from both of you and I really appreciate your time. Um, and I put in the chat, um, if you guys want to plug somewhere that people can learn more about you, um, either on Twitter or if you have um, a personal website, feel free to do so. Um, but I'm going to stop our broadcast in just a minute and thank everyone for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, yeah. <laughs> for organizing such a nice session. Thank you. Phil. Yeah, I think Kelly. Um, oh, yeah, we can add to the thing. So I'll post my... Um, email if anybody has specific questions it's especially about germany um just let me know yeah i'll send you uh, my email address that you can reach out great thanks Kristen. Yeah.
<laughs> I'll also do the yeah. same. So you're welcome to. Great. Thanks, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. You too. Bye.